Welcome to the Same Day Podcast, where we discuss driving incremental business growth and other topics related to real estate, property management, and entrepreneurship. Now, to the show at hand. Yoni Schmidt here with uh, the Same Day Podcast, where I connect with top business and real estate leaders. Past guests include Scott Reeves, and Chris Lyle. And today's episode is brought to you by Q-Rental Property Management. At Q-Rental Property Management, we're all about full service property management company, helping our clients buy, renovate, and operate real estate assets. We help our clients build wealth while taking the headache out of property management. Welcome to today's episode of the Same Day Podcast, where we shine a spotlight on the movers and shakers in the world of finance, real estate, and beyond. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting a truly remarkable guest, Brandon Nett. Brandon is not only a growth manager, team builder, investor, and consultant, but also a visionary in the realm of finance, real estate, and credit. With a career that spans over a decade, Brandon has demonstrated an unwavering passion for financial literacy, striving tirelessly to elevate others to a place of financial independence and security. Brandon, alongside his wonderful wife, Muriel, have built an impressive portfolio of single-family homes in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Their investment savvy and commitment to building strong tenant relationships has set the uh, standard in the industry, proving that sound investment methods and genuine care for people can indeed go hand in hand. Brandon's journey is a testament to the power of dedication, strategic thinking, and the profound impact of fostering financial literacy. We're excited to dive into his story, learn from his experience, and get inspired by the wisdom he has to share. Please join me in welcoming Brandon Neff to the Same Day Podcast. Brandon, thank you so much for being here today. Absolutely, man. Appreciate you having me. Thank you. Of course. Uh, so let's dive right in. Brandon, uh, I know a little bit about you, I guess. We've hung out a couple of times and you know, I've seen you around town. You're very plugged in. You're very involved in the world of real estate. Um, you know, We've talked a lot about finance, real estate, credit, all the things that you're doing. You have a massive following. Um, on social media when it comes to uh, the credit and finance world. Uh, you've also expressed a deep passion for finance, real estate, and credit in general. Can mm -hmm. you share a little bit about these uh, interests initially? How did they take root? And what has influenced your career? How has this influenced, I guess, your career trajectory? So I've got one of these stories. I was a super broke kid, right? Like I literally grew up in a trailer. Um, my parents always made decent money, but we never had money because they had no financial literacy, right? Money came in, money went out. That's just how it was. They are hard workers, but they are terrible with money. And I saw that from a fairly young age, but I still didn't have the education to really understand what I needed to do. Um, and it wasn't really until college and when I met my wife, who kind of put me in the right place, that kind of said, you need to do X, Y, and Z. And she kind of gave me this foundation of Quit spending money as soon as you earn it. Learn to save it, learn to invest it. And she likes to say she created a monster because she planted this seed and now I'm crazy. Like it, it, everything we do, we do extreme. So uh, it kind of came from a place of necessity and it's turned into a lifestyle. Um, I'm lucky it's turned into, like you said, a social media following. It's turned into jobs, consulting, and now a, you know, a, a portfolio of you know, 30, 36 rentals um, over the last couple of years. And it's really taken us to a place of financial, financial independence. And that was our goal. We started a few years back. We got to lean fire, which is financial independence, retire early at 33 years old. Um, decided we didn't want to live the lean, which you know is a little bit of money. We didn't want to live the lean life. We wanted to get to fat fire. Um, and the quickest, easiest way was through real estate. So um, we kind of took that leap and here we are. Nice. Love that. Um, so Mural is really the, the uh, you know, driver behind you that kind of sparked everything. Love that. We should probably host She was on a the catalyst. Podcast. Catalyst, and, definitely. And, you know, and I want to say something real quick about that because her and I have had this conversation a ton of times, and I think this is really important for people listening. Your network is your network, right? Like, it's who you know. And I think it's so important that people surround themselves with smart, educated people because I had no idea. And there's so many people that have no idea. And I think that's where it's so beneficial to be connected in the real estate space, the finance space. If you're getting into real estate and you don't understand, connect with somebody like Yoni and Key Renter, right? Like talk to these people that have done this because 
you just don't know what you don't know. And it's so important to have a role model and people that have done this to take those lessons and apply them to what you're doing. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, I know that you and Muriel are uh, self-managing your properties, but you and I have had tons of conversations and Muriel and I have had tons of conversations about, um, you know, stories just that we share with each other about what happened, how we handled the situation, and we just share the knowledge so that, you know, we can we can avoid those pitfalls. Um, I guess that's uh, really one of those, um, you know, one of those truly like powerful sound bites, I think, is like your net worth is your your network is your net worth is something that I've heard actually earlier this week. And I truly believe that, um, you know, that is the case. So with a strong emphasis on, you know, financial literacy, and how do you approach educating others? And what do you believe are the key components to achieving that financial independence? So I've got a very like in your face approach, right? Um, I think in the US, it's kind of been taboo for such a long time to talk about money. I remember growing up, my family was always very open about how broke we were and how we didn't have money to buy things, right? That was just kind of my experience with money. Um, and kind of the group of people I ran with, like we did some bad things when I was young, you know, like we did what we needed to do to get around. So finance and money and people owing money was stuff that was kind of talked about at one point. And I think because of that, like I kind of adopted this mindset that when I want to talk about money with somebody, I'm just going to straight up say, here's how it is. And I'm probably a little too open for most people. Um, but I do think that it's very important to have these conversations because generally speaking, in the United States, we have, we're, we're terrible with money. People are. You know, you look at your average net worth, you look at how much debt people have, things like this. It's because people don't know. They haven't been educated. And I think a big part of that is because it's been taboo to talk about. It. So my approach mm -hmm. is when I talk to somebody and they ask me questions, I'm super transparent. Like I'm in their face. I'm asking them questions that probably make some people uncomfortable to be straight. I just am. Mm -hmm. But I think what that does is when I start giving people information and giving them real answers, it develops a relationship with people who are like, He's not feeding me shit. He's mm -hmm. doing, you know, the best he can. He's giving me advice because I've lived it. Um, and I think, again, thus far, it's worked. You know, it's not for everybody, but I think those people that kind of have an experience or a background like me, they appreciate it. So I give people the knowledge. I give them the resources, um, even if it's not me. You know, like there's other people out there a lot smarter than me. I'm not smart. If I can do it, anybody can do it. That's the thing I always tell people. So there's a lot... A lot of people out there with a lot more education and a lot more brain power than me. Here's the resources. Go leak. Uh, go learn. And one thing I will say about all of this: real estate, financial independence, credit cards, credit, any of this stuff. You can lead a camel to water, but you can't force him to drink. Okay. So I can give you all the resources and all the foundation, but until you take the steps to actually do it, you know, nothing's going right. to happen. Yeah, agreed. I also agree that. Um, you know, the discussion of money is taboo in general, and that's the sentiment, but it shouldn't be. And sh people should uh, talk openly about it, ask the right questions, learn. And uh, yeah, I, I definitely agree that you can only lead them to the water. You can't force them to drink. So that's a great. Um, it's a hard conversation to have, right, bro? I mean, let's, let's be real. Like, it's not an easy conversation to have, especially right. if you're not in a good place financially. It's really hard mm -hmm. to tell somebody, hey, man, I've got. $50,000 in credit card debt and $100,000 in student loan debt. I want to mm -hmm. invest and build wealth. How do I do it? It's not easy. It's not. Yeah. And so finding those right resources, talking to the people who have done it before, uh, who have the experience is super important. Um, love learning that. And I love the, you know, the rags to riches story. It um, warms my heart and just like, you know, you. <laughs> makes a lot of sense that, you know, someone really wants to improve their life and their lifestyle. Uh, they would do anything it takes to, you know, work through it and just like build, uh, build their, their network and build their net worth. Um, so I guess, you know, you and Muriel, you know, started Evergreen Properties. Uh, your experience with Evergreen Properties shows a real knack for that team building and scaling a business. You've built, you know, a team of reliable contractors that you can call upon in any given moment. 
um, and scaled the business really rapidly since you've moved into the Tulsa market. Can you tell us a little bit, you know, about what the most effective strategies for assembling this high, high performing team and scaling the business uh, work? So this is a tough one, right? Because I think it's very case by case, it's market by market, but I can give you my general advice and what we did. Um, and it, it kind of comes down to the same answer I just gave you. We, we networked. So when we mm -hmm. came here, we, we had a couple rental properties in Washington state, which is where we're originally from. We decided to sell those because we, we just did the simple math. We could sell those two to mm -hmm. buy 10 here, right? And yeah. the cash flow went through them. Say that again. Did you 1031 them? No, I didn't 1031 them because I didn't have the education at the time, mm. right? I just didn't understand it. But luckily, I was smart enough. I did not I did know that two years, if you lived in a property two years, the last five years, and you sold it, you didn't have to pay the taxes on it the same. And I lived in both of those over the past five years. That's why I sold them when I did, because I was able to avoid the taxes. So I knew that. Um, so anyway, I, I moved those, transferred them over here. Um, I had the money sitting and I was in a new city. Like, what do I do? I have no idea. So I started going to the real estate meetups, right? I started going around. I found a realtor. I got lucky. I got connected to somebody um, that put me in touch with a contractor. And she actually ended up becoming my business partner. Um, and through her, because she'd been doing this for years, I just kind of lived on her coattails for a while. I was like, mm -hmm. all right, what's she doing? Okay, mm -hmm. I can do this. I can improve that. I kind of found the things I was good at, the things she wasn't, combined them, um, used the network she had and the network I had built, and I started finding people. And what I'm going to say, I don't want anybody out there to be like, oh, this is easy. It's not. Contractors are a pain in the ass. They're really difficult. Yeah. They're, it, it, it's the same thing with tenants, right? Like everything's good until it's not. Right. Okay? Um, and it's trial and error, and you're going to take losses, and it's going to happen. And I definitely have. I've taken some really, uh, I just, infuriating situations, but I am to the point, yes, where I've got a, you know, I've got a, a very investor friendly um, plumber, electrician, drywall person, painter, general contractor, woodworker, finisher, all these people. And it's been through trial and error, but to answer your question simply, and I know it sounds repetitive, repetitive but you have to network, you have to be mm -hmm. out there, with people, get in the Facebook groups, connect with people like Yoni and Matt and the people that have been doing this forever and talk to their contractors. The thing I will say, the biggest advantage I self-manage, you guys are a property management company. One of the biggest advantages of what you guys do is you have this network of people in place. You don't have to go through this hardship. You, Mariel and I say that you pretty much pay an education. It's like going to college. You're going to take these losses. You're going to lose money in some capacity that you're paying for education. Um, yeah. You don't want to do that. There's property manager. There's people like, key renter that can help you out, that can, can kind of cut that learning curve down pretty significantly. Yeah. I mean, we've done it. Some of the mistakes that we've made were also, uh, you know, at the early start were just like exp expensive lessons and expensive, um, you know, moments of education, I would say. And oftentimes you'd be surprised, but maybe you wouldn't, um, maybe our listeners would be a little surprised. You know, your best landscaper, your best plumber, HVAC contractor, is probably not on Google. They're not marketing. They're not out there, you know, pushing their name out and, um, you know, spending tons of money on marketing. And you'll find them at the gas station fueling their truck. And the only reason you or know that they're- Home Depot. Yeah, Lowe's and Home Depot, Depot checking out when you're checking out. Yeah, exactly. And you see what they're buying. They're buying 10 capacitors and you're like, are you, are you by chance, a, you know, a licensed HVAC contractor? And the answer is like, yes, I am. And, you know, that's your best, that becomes your best HVAC contractor. Um, I do remember one of our best landscapers in Oklahoma City, for example, literally um, stumbled upon him in at a gas station, just fueling his pump. And the only reason I knew was because of the trailer that he had and all the equipment that was in it. And, um, you know, just sparked up a conversation with him. And ever since then, uh, he's been working with us in Oklahoma City, providing really great um, value to our clients because he he's not necessarily spending thousands and tens of thousands of dollars on marketing and we can consistently feed him work and he gives us that preferential pricing and um, treatment um, yeah 
So as someone who's been involved in every aspect of building a business from, you know, sales to quality service um, to, you know, scaling it, uh, what have been the most challenging and, re and rewarding parts of, you know, wearing so many hats? Because I know you're, you know, wearing the hat of the deal sourcer. You're wearing the hat of the, um, you know, general contractor and the rehabber and the, um, you know, uh, leasing agent and the property manager. And it just never ends. And in some cases, even probably the maintenance guy who's like coming out to just like make sure that this is something maybe it's simple and you can fix it right there and then. And it's not something that you're going to have to like um, get, a, you know, someone who's going to cost you $65, $75 an hour to go out and do the work. And you're, you're really helping your bottom line at the end of the day. Yeah. So you hit it right on the head. Um, I, I, I will say, I think the most difficult part about business in general is, yeah, you have to wear so many hats. You have to do everything. I think a lot of times people come up with an idea, a really good idea. They start a business and they don't realize they have to be the accountant. They have to be this, they have to be that. And in real estate, it's even more difficult because yeah, you have to do maintenance. You have to be the GC, all these different things. And I'll say the, the biggest challenge has probably consistently been, you know, the horsepower, the bandwidth, whatever you want to call it, just the wherewithal to continue to do it. Um, there's been plenty of times where I've been like, screw this, I'm going to sell my properties, take my equity and go do something else. Um, but it's just, real estate has so many advantages, tax advantages, long-term wealth building. And there's just so much to it. Like it's silly. It, I think generally speaking, it's silly to sell if you're, if you're doing well and successful. Um, there's definitely a time to sell, don't get me wrong, but um, I definitely get to that point. So yeah, the biggest hurdle I think for us and the biggest issue we've had um, is that time management. We, we, I think we're lucky from the perspective that there's two of us. It's me and my wife. Um, and we'd already gotten to financial independence or financial you know, freedom. So we could kind of jump into this full time and, and learn. And I know that's not what everybody can do. And again, I know I harp on this, but that's where a property manager becomes very, very advantageous. But for us, um, like really getting in there, getting our hands dirty, doing it all and making these connections with these people that will tell us, you know, you should try this, you should try that. That's been very important to us. Um, I think, think, generally speaking, the key to this has been the flow between my wife and I. Okay, I can't do this. You can't do this. So I'll do the bookkeeping. She'll do the tenant placement, right? Like we've really had to kind of differentiate what we do. And sure, we help each other out, but like you kind of have to sit down and differentiate and make defined roles and what, find out what people are good and are not good at. Um, and I think the, the other key, somebody told me this a long time ago in business, surround yourself with people that are smarter than you. Mm -hmm. Right. Just, I know I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but I've got people around me are smart. So my GC is super, I shouldn't call my GC. My, my go-to guy is super smart. He knows everything about construction, right? I've got a very good CPA and tax strategist. Like these individual people are smarter than me, better than me. They do, they do what they do. Um, and I'm kind of at the, at the center of it, feeding them the information. Um, and I think that's really important. Build, build your team out and let them do what they do. And let them give you advice and quit. Don't be a know-it-all. Like, listen to what people tell you. Listen to what advice they give you. Yeah, I love that. I mean, for us at Curenter, one of the things that I always um, tell our business development managers and even, you know, a philosophy that I live by is um, always add value to people's lives and, you know, do it with the expectation of nothing in return and act as a thought partner to those landlords and homeowners that call us day in, day out, and they're asking tough questions about, you know, evictions and, um, you know, vacancies and, um, you know, just trying to help them however we can. And you're absolutely right. I think you're also, in general, we are the average of the person of the people and the, you know, groups that we surround ourselves by. So always constantly striving to surround ourselves with smarter people will yield um, you know, just a, a better uh, network, which will yield a better net worth. And overall, you know, a lot of people have done what we're doing. Like you said, it's not rocket science, right? It's not that difficult. Anyone can learn this. I feel the same way. I'm probably not the smartest person in the room. And I enjoy being surrounding myself and being around people who are much smarter than me. 
and have done this in the past and uh, ask them those questions that, you know, may help me help a client or help someone avoid a really expensive financial mistake, right? Um, so, you know, talking a little bit about your investments in Tulsa, you know, those have yield, yielded impressive results. I mean, you're in my neighborhood. We live in the same neighborhood. I see those properties. I drive by them often. Um, you know, I see what you've done. You're like really improving the face of the neighborhood uh, in a way that I'm extremely thankful because you're adding value to all of our properties. Um, tell us a little bit about what drew you and Muriel to Tulsa and, you know, what makes it an attractive market for investors? So quick shout out to uh, Mike Bosch at Tinto. Um, if you don't yeah. know Mike Bosch, he is kind of like this unstoppable force that moved to Tulsa years back and has just changed the landscape of what this city is. He was implemental in the early um, stages of Tulsa Remote, which is the program I came on. Um, and it's one of those things you see on the news. This city will pay you $10,000 to move to this city. And most people are like, that's crap. Well, it's not. I moved to Tulsa uh, almost five years ago now uh, on Tulsa Remote. They gave me $10,000 to come here. Um, and I used that as a down payment on a house that was $40,000. Oh my God, I love that. That kind of answers everything right there. So why did I want to come here? $40,000 house. And guess what? That house rented for $950 a month. Wow. And Those are so incredible returns. Incredible numbers. And now I will be straight with you and say that that doesn't necessarily exist today. Um, Tulsa has appreciated like everywhere. Everything got crazy with COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but there are still outstanding deals. Um even a bad deal in Tulsa today, or I'm sorry, even an average deal in Tulsa mm -hmm. today that people kind of look at and go, eh, would be an outrageously good deal on the East Coast and the West Coast, okay? These big markets, um, yes, they're attractive because you might make some pretty good appreciation, but let me tell you something. Appreciation is not guaranteed. Things happen all the time. Cash flow, which is why I came to Tulsa, um, is very, very important because you can use that cash flow to create long-term wealth in a number of ways. So I went from cash flowing on my two rentals in Washington State. We were cash flowing like $2,500 a month, which was crazy good because I didn't carry much debt. I came to Tulsa. Um, where I'm at now, we've, we've, we've done some flips and done some other things, but now we cash flow almost $14,000 a month on wow. our doors. We've got almost $2 million in equity, and we've done this in about... So we've been here almost five years, but we didn't really get started until year one. So we're about four years in. Um, and it's just, it. Tulsa is such a unique market. I, I always tell everybody, we're this close to becoming something special, this city. We really are. And with the changes that are happening, the people that are going into play, some of the things that I know are happening behind the scenes, I think we're going to be there. And what's going to be really, really interesting for people, especially as investors, is we've got this crazy good opportunity for cash flow. But mm. if these things happen, we're going to have this crazy good opportunity for appreciation like these other cities. So we're kind of going to be, you know, where the two circles meet. We're going to be that perfect place, I think, um, in the next few years. And I think the best time to buy real estate was yesterday. The second yeah. best is today, right? So like get on it, make a move. And like time in market is better than timing the market. So I know a lot of people are worried about what's going to happen to the market. But let me tell you something. Real estate in general. You make a bad buy today, guess what? 10, 10 years down the road, it's going to be a good buy. That's right. just, how it's just how it works. It tends to be extremely forgiving in the long term. And everything ends up being cheap in the rear view mirror. Yep. Um, so I 100% agree with that. Uh, Mike Bosch was actually a guest on the podcast. So uh, shout out to him. And mm -hmm. uh, shout out to Matt Zalk, who convinced him to move to Tulsa. And then subsequently, he moved his entire family um, from all over the world to Tulsa, Oklahoma, which has and, been awesome. And thousands uh, of random people through Tulsa Remote. <laughs> yeah. So great program. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you talk about investment opportunities. Uh, you know, how are you finding these investment opportunities in the market right now? What are your strategies? I mean, I know, uh, of course, it's networking. It's knowing the people who um, are going to be selling their properties or are interested in selling their properties. Um, you know, getting out of the market and uh, making room for new investors. 
what would you say your maybe like top three strategies in terms of finding good opportunities to invest in? So something that I do is a little unique is I'll actually knock on doors. Right. So I will drive um, in my neighborhoods. And if I see a house, I'm knocking on doors. I'm tracking the person down. For example, literally the house right across the street from me right now, I'm talking to this guy to try to buy his house. And mm-hmm. the reason I know he wants to sell it is because he had renters in there. They weren't good. They trashed the place. So I will actually talk to people. Um, I, I think a lot of investors are afraid to do that um, or they're intimidated or they want to use a wholesaler or a cold caller. And those methods work. Don't get me wrong, but I've had great success buying houses by knocking on doors, looking at people in their eyes and saying, this is what I'm going to do. Um, I also think we kind of have a unique approach to it because I'm really, really happy to take places that most other people pass on because they're mm-hmm. too much work. Like the house I live in right in your neighborhood, Yoni, this house had two holes in the roof the size of cars and the foundation was collapsed and it was condemned wow. because they were they were they were um, cooking crack in the house. Okay. Wow. That's how bad the house is. It's now a $350,000 house. I have $150,000 in equity and it's beautiful. So strategy number one is knock on people's doors. Strategy number two is to kind of find your niche, right? Like what you're willing to do. Some people, they're really, really good at quick rehabs and getting people in there fast. And like, if that's what you do, great. I will take a, the most dilapidated house and make it beautiful. So um, I think that's the other key to my strategy, how I'm tracking down deals. Is I'm taking things other people pass on. Okay? Mm-hmm. Um, and probably number three, I would say the traditional outlets, right? Like the networking for people just saying, hey, I've got this house or I've got a friend that this is coming up. One of my realtor friends will call me and say they have a pocket deal. If you don't know what a pocket deal is, it just means essentially a realtor that has a deal coming up and they tell you about it before it goes on the MLS mm-hmm. or Zillow, if somebody doesn't know what that means. Um, those and, you know, wholesalers call me, they know my neighborhoods, they know my buying boxes. Um, and I, I'm just ready to buy when I'm ready to buy. So I think it's worked out. So those three things combined have equaled a pretty solid portfolio, in my opinion. Yeah. Love that. Knocking on doors. That's, um, definitely, you know, the true and tried, uh, I guess, uh, way of doing business in general. And this is a relationship based industry and, you know, in general. So um, looking people in the eye and, you know, making them an offer is a great way to, uh, you know, find an opportunity and know if you have a partner on the other side who's willing to actually work with you. Love that. Um, You know, one of the things that I've always been so impressed with is how you've managed to place high quality long-term tenants in your properties. Uh, I speak to Mariel about this often, and uh, she tells me stories and I, I really hear stories about, you know, the really, really horrible tenants and the nightmare tenants. And it has to do, I guess, with the way that you operate your business. Can you tell us a little bit about the secret sauce to building strong relationships with your tenants and ensuring that mutual satisfaction, not just for the self-managing landlords, but also for us, the property managers out there who want to do a really good job for our owners? So I want to start out by by saying it hasn't been perfect, right? Like I'm still learning, we've had our issues. But I will say generally speaking, um, based off the number of properties I have and you know what I've done, I think I do better than the average person. Um, first of all, my secret sauce is Mariel. Um, I've said that time and time again. She's just got this personality that she brings the best out of people. She lights up a room. She's like the... Per- she should be a real estate agent and a property manager full time, but she doesn't want to do it. She's too lazy. She wants to sit on the couch and uh, raise a baby and watch Netflix. But um, either way, uh, her and her approach to people, um, she's just so happy. She puts, she takes any sort of tension and like any sort of tension is the best way to say it out of the, out of the air because we show all of our properties, and I think that's part of it. A lot of people do automated showings. You call up a company and you say, hey, I want to go look at one, two, three Main Street. And they say, great, fill out an application. If you're approved, we'll give you a lockbox code. You go over there between this time and this time and look at the property. Mm-hmm. I understand the automation side of that, especially if you're a large landlord. You got to do that. You can't go to every single property. Mm-hmm. I get it. But at our level where we are, we've got, and I'll say it, like the, the advantage of being able to go meet the tenant, sit down, talk to them, show them the property. 
And like our passion, I think, comes through because we really try to do our properties right. Pretty much everything we get, we get to the studs, new electric, new plumbing, new HVAC, new windows, new drywall, new appliances, new cabinets. And when we can show that to the tenant, they get excited, right? So they're like, okay, mm-hmm. these people care. And we can look them in the eye again and say, hey, if you have a maintenance issue, call us. We're going to take care of it. If you're unhappy, let us know. And I think what that does is it kind of puts us in a unique situation where not everybody else can do that. So these people are like, all right, I'm going to do, give these people, th- it's a beautiful house. And because all of our properties are pretty nice. And these people are going to take care of me. So we tend to get tenants that are happy. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I'll say, this is a double-edged sword though. And we were talking about that before the podcast started. Having these really good relationships where we're almost friends um, creates this awesome opportunity to ca- make cash flow and the people stay and everybody's happy. But mm-hmm. it also, it almost gives them, I guess, the ability to feel like because we're so friendly that they can call us about every single thing. Um, and that does, I think, maybe result in a little bit more text messages at eight o'clock at night than typically mm-hmm. somebody gets. Um, and most of the, most of our pro- properties are maintenance free to be straight with you because they're pretty much new. I know that won't be the case in 10 years, but I will have a tenant call and say, Hey, uh, somebody, I've got an apartment complex. There's a car in the parking lot, but I don't know who it is. Do you have any idea who it is? They're not going to call key renter eight o'clock or nine o'clock at night and say right. that the case they're going to send something through, um, and maybe it gets addressed. So it's a double-edged sword. It can create a little bit of extra, I, I guess, hand-holding is probably the best way mm-hmm. to say it. But I would say, generally speaking, I think I do better. I rent my properties very, very quickly. I know my tenants. They know me. Um, I have a very, very low um, turnover rate. And I have a very, very low not pay rate. I've had one eviction over, I don't know, I guess if you do the math over essentially 120 doors um, over the last four years. It's pretty, mm-hmm. it's pretty solid. Pretty solid. Yeah, that's impressive. I love that. Um, you know, so generally speaking, you are a property manager, right? You're a self-managing landlord. Um, you know, we do it on a different, uh, we, we do it differently, of course, because we're managing third party. We're managing a little bit for ourselves. But, you know, mm-hmm. I'd say 90% of the doors that we manage and the single family homes that we manage and complexes that we manage are for other investors. Um what are you noticing, right, in the property management sector as it evolves, um, you know, are the trends and how do you ensure that you and Muriel and your team are, you know, implementing those best practices in just general management and growth? That's a really good question because I think this is an industry that consistently changes. Mm-hmm. Um, I did say my parents worked really hard, but they were bad with money. Um, my mom actually was a property manager. That's what she did. Uh, although she did property management for like HOAs, like high-end mm-hmm. condominiums. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have been around the industry in some capacity for years, you know, even though I didn't really realize I was absorbing it, um, I was absorbing it and I watched things change. And I think today what we're seeing is um, when, as people scale, they realize what they have to do and that is put processes in place, right? You need mm-hmm. to have processes. And I think it's really difficult for a lot of people to take advice from other people. But again, some of these people have done so much, you can kind of almost buy, and I know it's not sexy, but there's a lot of people out there that are giving good information. They'll buy, you can buy like, here's the packet, here's how to be a landlord, and they can give you these processes in place. And Mm -hmm. back in the day, that was, you know, it, it was unique. Like people weren't sharing. Now everybody's sharing. Like there's influencers out there trying to make money off you. Some of them are good or some of them are bad. But what I will say is because there's so much technology out there today, um, you can do this. You can scale. If you keep up with the technology, you keep up with what's changing, you can scale pretty quickly. And you don't need a ton of, you know, you don't need to spend a ton of time figuring things out. If you follow these processes, you put them in place early on. It's going to make your life so much easier as you scale. Um, mm-hmm. For example, like there's so many property management softwares out there. I'm not sure who you guys use, but you know, there's TurboTenant, there's Building, there's all mm-hmm. these. We're lucky. Like think of how easy it is. All that stuff is in one place. 25 years ago, they didn't have this. Yeah. And so, it's pretty inexpensive. 
I, I definitely think it's inexpensive, especially once you get big, right? It really is. So you're right. So I, I think that's the trend. Technology is coming out, trying to make things easier. Stay, stay up to date with that. Stay up to date with it and see what other people are doing. Um, and, you know, if people have had a really bad experience with something, like make sure you take that into account. If they're telling you, hey, I know you just spent money on this program, but I had a terrible experience. Make sure you listen. Don't discredit them. You're not learning if you're talking. So shut up and listen to what people are telling. You. Yeah, love that. Um, speaking about, you know, updating, you mentioned updating uh, a moment ago, you know, your, your processes, your systems, um, you know, talking a little bit about your properties. I've seen the level of renovation that you and Muriel uh, bring these properties to and the standard that you bring them to. It's really nice, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, what kind of strategies do you employ to, I guess, maintain and enhance your property value over time? I know that you're, you know, ripping a lot of them down to the studs and rebuilding, making them super, super nice so that a tenant really wants to live there and they're excited about everything. Um, could you tell me what have you found like is the best value? What's the best, like the biggest bang for your buck when you're uh, putting money into your rental and you want to force value and appreciation and potentially even like increase the rents. So I, I want to start out by saying, I think we are guilty a little bit of overdoing things sometimes. I definitely know people out there that make better money than I do that do less. Okay. Just to be straight. That said, um, I think when it comes time for them to turn around and sell their properties, they're gonna have to put more money into it and they're not gonna mm -hmm. get as much as I am because most of my properties are to a level that I think a homeowner would buy and be happy to more or less move in. And I don't think you can say that for all rent. Mm -hmm. so let me, you know, again, double-edged sword. Now that said, I think it's when people walk into our properties, something that we consistently see um, or we consistently hear like, oh, I love this is our kitchens are very nice. We do. Mm -hmm. We do custom shaker cabinets um, that we, again, we've developed a deal with somebody here. We do, we do like a dark navy blue or a dark green, do these really unique colors that pop that are trendy. We do stainless steel appliances. We typically do hardwood floors and we do like designer tile and paint. Okay. Mm -hmm. so these things are things that people get really excited for. The, I, I know it seems silly, but the cosmetics is what sells so many people. When I'm sitting there telling somebody, guess what? You have a new HVAC, you have new windows, you have new plumbing, you have new electric. They don't care. They're like, I mm. want to go look at the pretty tile in the bathroom. Yeah. Right. So I, I think those, you get a lot of bang for your buck from bathrooms, from kitchens, um, and curb appeal. Curb appeals sure. are really, you know, one of the reasons I love Tulsa is because we have a ton of craftsman homes. Mm -hmm. And we came from Portland, Oregon, uh, Washington, uh, and like these level, this house, I told you my house is worth, I don't know, 350,000, whatever that number is. Um, this would be a million, million two to a million five important. So I love the fact that I get to move into these beautiful old 1920s homes, revive them, create these beautiful porches, get this crazy good curb appeal, and it's still affordable. And yeah. I will say to your point, um, when you do this stuff and you put this you get this level of passion, you get excited, you can show it to people and they can see it. It does increase your rents. It does increase mm -hmm. how much money you make. So I try to always stay within the 1% rule. Um, so anybody that doesn't know it, 1% rule just essentially says, if you spend, for easy math, if you spend $100,000 on a house all in, you need to be bringing in 1% of that per month. So $1,000 per month. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like my general rule per door. So every house or property I have, whether it's a single family or my apartment complex, I try to stay at 1%. So I try to keep my renovation, my total costs, including my renovations within that total number that will be 1% of what I think it can rent for. And then I get my best bang for my buck based off what that's going to be. Typically kitchens, bathrooms, curb appeal. Yeah, love that. Um, you know, hard to find the 1% rule nowadays, like yes, at least I for... You know, turnkey properties, it does uh, require knocking on doors and building your network. Um, and the curb appeal is a really important aspect because that's your first impression, right? Money. And you only get one shot at making your, you know, a really good first impression. And if you don't have great curb appeal to your property, then someone's just going to roll up and they may just drive right off. So 
super spend important. That little, spend that little bit of extra for some landscaping, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. Yep. Um, love it. So tell me, I guess, what advice can you give to small investors or newbies that are coming into uh, the real estate investment world? What avenues exist for them? And you know, what should they consider before diving in? So a piece of advice I always tell everybody, and this may not be the most popular thing, but it's just do it. Do not get stuck in this analysis paralysis because, again, I said it earlier, you might not make the best buy today, but 10 years down the road, it's going to be a good buy. Mm -hmm. And you passing up on these two or three deals, you're, I promise you, you're going to end up kicking yourself um, down the road. I know personal experience, like everything Same. I saw in 2020 and 2021, I should have just bought. I don't care if it wasn't a good deal at the yeah. time. Today, Oh, I'm killing myself. So um, I'm not saying go buy on a whim. I'm not saying don't do your research. I'm not saying don't educate yourself. But I'm saying if you've got a deal that you're on the edge, just buy. Look at mm -hmm. it as look at it as buying an education. You're instead of going to college, maybe you spend an extra ten thousand dollars on this property that you shouldn't have. But ten years down the line, you're going to have so much more education. So that's my number one piece of advice: don't get stuck. Just do it. Jump in. Time. Time in the market is better than timing in the market. Just mm -hmm. do it. Love it. Um, you know, as uh, giving advice, speaking of giving advice, you know, as a self-managing landlord who's doing it yourself, um, sometimes, you know, looking into the world of property management that, you know, does it third party, what advice would you give property managers and property management companies to ensure that they keep their owners happy, retain the properties under their management, um, you know, and uh, essentially do this effectively and, and, you know, do it to a place where tenants are happy. What are the major things that you would say are the most important for property managers doing third party property management? This, this is a super easy answer and it's communication. It's, communicate. It's, you've got to communicate. Like there is nothing more frustrating than because let me back up. When I said I had the Washington property, I actually used my mom's property management company um, to take care of that when we were living in Oklahoma at first. Um, mm -hmm. Out of state property management is pretty tough. It really yeah. is. Um, and again, that's where a company like you guys really shine. Um, but having done it and not getting the level of communication um, drives me crazy. Mm -hmm. Let me give you kind of a horror story um, to, to drive this home. They took seven months to rent my condo. Wow. Uh, part of that was because they came up with this outrageous number that they wanted to rent it for at first. Um, I was fairly new. And I was like, you guys are the experts. I'm going to let you do it. Three months into it, I said, you guys are crazy. This is crap. We're going to do my number. Of course, it starts getting hits. And then they had issues finding a qualified candidate. Again, I was finding all this information out because I was calling, I was, you know, mm -hmm. saying, what, what's going on? They weren't communicating with me. So it was super frustrating. Seven months in, they placed this tenant. Um, wasn't a good tenant. Uh, the guy did stay for two years, but at the end of the two years, he trashed my place. Wow. He locked himself out of our garage. And instead of calling the property management company, and this will be number two thing that property managers need to do instead of getting in contact with our property management company, he took an ax to my garage door, my big two-car wow. garage, cut it down, ripped it out so he could drive to work. Okay, so that was the level of tenant that they put into this place um, after seven months and telling me they couldn't find a qualified candidate. So really frustrating because I wasn't getting And none of this was explained to me until I called. Like, mm -hmm. if you find out that somebody's ripped down a garage door, you need to tell me. If you're having problems renting a place, you need to tell me. If there's going to be a maintenance request that's going to be a very large expense, tell me. Communicate with me. It's so important. If you don't, you're going to have pissed off homeowner or pissed off landlord, period. Yeah. And that leads me to yeah. number two is like maintenance, maintenance requests, things like that. I think it's really important. I don't know if you guys have it, but something I've learned I think there needs to be something spelled out very specifically early on. If it's under $250, you guys have got the okay to do it. If mm -hmm. it's between $50 and $1,000, we need to have communication. If it's over $1,000, needs to be in writing. It Like X, Y, and Z, you need to give me a specific quote. Because yeah. 
nothing kills cash flow like a surprise thousand fifteen hundred dollar water heater. Yeah, uh, it just you know boom there there's a there's three months worth of profit gone right. Yeah, and I I, I think you combine the the maintenance and the communication on that side with the having processes in place for us um that that all adds up it's really important um i and that's me on the outside looking in because i am eventually going to use a property manager company i am yeah. going to retire and go somewhere else and let somebody else run my property someday love it I have those things i'm gonna you know i'm gonna throw a rock through your window <laughs> yeah so I will tell you, I mean, at Key Ranger, the way we do it is when a property is vacant, we do a every Tuesday traction report and we send it to the owner, letting them know um, exactly how many leads have been interested in the property, how many of those leads have been pre-qualified, how many of those pre-qualified leads scheduled showings, and how many of those that scheduled showing actually showed up to the property. And you get this every Tuesday, as long as your property is vacant. And, you know, communication is a key aspect and it's one of our um, core values is just communicate it. As far as the maintenance goes, um, we've built automated systems to where any time a tenant puts in a work order, you receive an automated email with a PDF of that work order saying, hey, Brandon, your tenant at 123 Main Street has submitted the following work order. No action required on your part. Um, you know, We just want to make sure that you're informed. So there are no surprises at the end of the month. What that allows you to do is either prepare yourself for that financial expenditure because you know that that hot water heater is 20 years old and it's time for it to be replaced or it's your time to run interference and just take it forward it to your dedicated property manager and say hey i just replaced that hot water heater here's the contact information for the plumber who did the work can you please work with this person so that i don't have to incur a charge and um you know see what the issue is diagnose it and resolve it uh it comes down to a hundred percent communication and transparency our threshold is, uh, you were close, it's $300, but anything over $300, uh, barring emergencies, of course, would require written uh, confirmation and communication from the owner. And in some cases, a couple of quotes to you know, make sure that we're really getting that you know, great price for the owner. So love the fact that those are really the two things that you um, find really frustrating because and you're uh, doing it. <laughs> we know, we know, you know from experiences that Owners don't want to be surprised. Investors don't want to be surprised that now their you know returns are going to be uh, hurt or you know well under what they expected, and um, you know just discovered at the end of the day. That's why at Kieran we also offer a checking account like experience to all of our investors, where you can log in and see expenses and income daily, understanding your cash flow and um, cash on cash and cap rates. So uh, we have an owner dashboard and an investor dashboard for all of our owners that own single family residential uh, homes. And then, you know, hopefully in the future, we'll be able to work with this company out of Israel, BlanketHomes.com, Leora Bramovich and uh, Sagi Medina, who are developing this platform and offer it to also multifamily um, investors. So they have a really unique product that um, I'll be excited to just hang out with you, sh go to coffee and just share what they can, uh, what they can do and how they can help. But lastly, beyond your professional accomplishments and everything that you're doing, um, what might people be surprised to learn about you, um, any unusual or interests and, in, you know, any unusual hobbies or interests. I know you and Muriel love to travel, any recent trips coming up or ones that you've just gone on. Um, and I know that, you know, you've, uh, you're a true survivor of, um, you know, a difficult, um, you know, a difficult, uh, uh, disease that, um, you know, is not necessarily something that's easy to maybe talk about, but, um, it's, a, an inspiration to people that you're like pushing through and just, you know, not, not giving up and like, you know, really, really, um, it, just doing everything that you can to stay you know, active and, and involved and um, it's a real inspiration. So I think people should hear this message. Yeah. So I was, uh, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer at 38. Um, and again, crazy story kind of runs along with my life. Um, more or less, they gave me six months to live here in Tulsa. So I freaked out um, and 
made some made some bad choices on the real estate side and financial side. So I was trying to get things done and push through some real than have to deal with deal with a lot of this stuff on our own. One of my friends pushed me to MD Anderson. Um, went down anyways over the last two years, being in treatment, I got the all clear. Uh, so that's kind of a unique fact. Um, I went from having stage four cancer and being told I have six months to live to like literally last two weeks ago being told I have no evidence of disease. So that's a big one. Um, but to your other point, like, yes, we are huge travelers. Uh, we've been to 83 countries and I do it all through credit card points and miles. Um, I've earned, I've earned or saved over six, well, coming up on seven figures now through credit card points and miles. So wow. learn to optimize the programs, um, take advantage of the sign up bonuses, take advantage of this, all these different things they offer. Um, I'm one of those geeks that nobody wants to listen to, but I run my own social media, my own Facebook group surrounding all of it, because what I love about it is it gives pretty much everybody the opportunity to put their credit in line, put their financial life in line, understand some financial literacy and travel the world for pennies on the dollar. So, uh, yeah, that's something that if I'm at a party, uh, people end up hating me because I don't shut up about it. <laughs> Love it. How can people find you on uh, Facebook and uh, your group and just uh, those who are interested in financial literacy investments, um, finance in general? Uh, tell us about that. Sure. So uh, we have developed uh, our own or started developing our own brand. It's called The Neth Lab. And so um, our last name is Neth and we take houses from meth to Neth. I love so, that. Uh, the Net Lab. And then um, my Facebook, we run a Facebook group with like 45,000 members. It's called FBZ Elite Travel and Points. We talk about travel and points. And then I have a 150,000 member real estate group. Um, it's Bigger Pockets fans. So we talk about everything real estate. You have, you know, 150,000 other investors. If you want to network, that's a great place. And again, with all of these, the credit card side and the real estate side, the end goal being financial independence. Right. So we have a fire mindset with everything we do. Um, that's what we're looking to do. And, you know, I'm always open. If you want to track me down, send me a DM. I'll do everything I can to help you out because uh, I think that's the most important thing. Love that. We'll include those links um, in the podcast uh, in the notes below. So if anyone wants to reach out to Brandon, uh, they can. And Brandon, thank you so much for this truly remarkable and inspirational story. Uh, I love what you and Muriel are doing, um, really setting the bar high. And I really appreciate you being here today on our podcast. Hey, man, thanks for the invite. I appreciate it. I feel lucky to know you guys. I appreciate that. Thanks for listening to the Same Day Podcast. Tune in to a new show each week and be sure to subscribe to get future episodes.